Hello everybody and welcome back to SFF 180. It is Monday, June the 10th and time once again for the mailbag. Sorry about last week you guys, as some of you may have noticed if you read my community post last week. There was supposed to be a mailbag last Monday. Last week was not an intentional skip week. Uh, turns out that I had uh, a mic go bad on me. Uh, I made two attempts to record the mailbag last weekend. Both ended in disaster, and all I could figure out was that my mic had just died. It was The sound was just horrible. So yeah, nothing really to be done for that except order a new one and try to start fresh this week. So it's been way too long since I've been away from recording. I feel terrible about it. But what you're going to get today are all of the books in the first half of this mailbag that you would have seen last week. All right, all the stuff you were supposed to see last week on the third. And then in the second half, I'm going to do everything that has turned up in the mail during the week. So all the new stuff. So effectively a two-week mailbag. Unintentional, but what can I do? You know, I mean, technical issues are a thing, right? They happen when you're YouTubing. You know, all you can do is just sort of forge ahead, right? So uh, otherwise, I hope you guys have had a great week and a great weekend. Mine has been good. It's been an interesting week. Um, I, I have some things scheduled for this coming week that potentially kind of exciting could spell some major life changes in the near future. Uh, not the kind of life changes that would be bad or terrible or be anything that would disrupt the channel. If anything, it would like disrupt the channel in a positive way. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm you know a little on the cusp of something that's I'm a little nervous about, but a little excited about at the same time. And uh, well, if anything comes of that, I will stop teasing you and, and tell you about it. But uh, <laughs> otherwise, that was my week last week, and it's going to be part of this week too. But something else that's going to be part of this week will be books and new videos and uploads and things like that. Now that I'm sort of like back in the saddle, um, you know, in terms of recording. Although I am going to have to do a little bit of traveling back and forth. I'm still going to make the time as best I can to devote to the channel and to new content for you guys, which is way overdue, all right? So at this point, I'm going to shut up now, and I'm going to start with all of last Monday's books, which will not take terribly long, because at least this time I don't have to sit here opening packages. And the first of the books that you would have seen me open last Monday would have been this, the finished copy of Fall or Dodge in Hell, the new book by Neil Stevenson. This is absolute top priority on my review queue, so you don't have to prompt me for this one. But this did come out in stores last Tuesday on the 4th, and uh, it, it goes like this. I have to say, this has got to be one of the most entertaining sell sheets I have read in a long time. Uh, at the heart of Stevenson's epic new novel, Fall or Dodge in Hell, are far-reaching technological, philosophical, political, and spiritual questions. Could a human consciousness ever be uploaded digitally and restarted? Would a new digital realm necessarily resemble the world we know, or could it possibly be different? Avoiding the social inequality, violence, and environmental disaster that we currently face. Would such a world be akin to paradise or more like hell? A few years from now, Richard Dodge Forthrast, a middle-aged tech billionaire, is about to undergo a routine medical procedure in Seattle. Having made his fortune by founding a video gaming company, of course, Dodge now looks forward to pursuing his independent interests, which include applying the technology of gaming to some of humanity's biggest challenges. He also wants to deepen his relationship with his adored niece, Zula, and her young daughter, Sophia. But something goes terribly wrong during the procedure, and Dodge is declared brain dead, throwing Zula, the rest of his family, and his many attorneys into crisis. For it's not just a question of whether to pull the plug on Dodge's vegetative body. As his heirs discover, years earlier, Dodge had written a will directing his body to be placed in the custody of a cryonics company, controlled by the brilliant, occasionally antagonistic tech billionaire... Elmo Shepard. <laughs> the mission of Shepard's company is to preserve the brains of Dodge and other wealthy customers until technology exists that can somehow allow them to be brought back to life. Less than 20 years after his death, it does. What's more, Dodge's grandniece Sophia, now a student at Princeton, has become a major player in developing it. After Dodge's brain is digitally scanned and stored in the cloud, Sophia makes the bold decision to turn it on. Stevenson takes readers on a wildly imaginative journey through the new bit world that is gradually created by Dodge and the thousands of other digital souls that eventually populated it. 
Uh, for this is, in essence, an eternal afterlife. Death itself has been disrupted so long as the server farms of the physical world keep humming. That's, that's the trick. Meanwhile, back in the physical world, or meat space, equally remarkable events occur, including one of the most outrageous and widespread internet hoaxes ever perpetrated. This, in turn, leads to a digital counteroffensive, a complete collapse of confidence known as the fall of the internet and the de facto partition of the United States between an impoverished realm of superstition and barbarism, called Ameristan, <laughs> and wealthy coastal and urban regions dominated by the tech elite. To protect themselves from hoaxes and fake news, citizens receive digital information curated by their 24-7 personal editors, while using holographs and digital veils to foil facial recognition and other invasive technologies. Furthermore, sharp disagreements develop between Elmo Shepard and Dodge's heirs, over fundamental aspects of the way Bitworld is evolving. As the striking red leaves of fall mark the passage of the years in both the physical and digital worlds, Dodge's family and friends gradually die and migrate one by one into Bitworld. So this takes place over a long period of time. Uh, the conflict, which resonates with echoes of mythology, the Bible, and human history, becomes a war that stretches across eons of Bitworld time, filled with enchantingly strange landscapes and beings, and a heroic quest for a hidden key of ultimate power. So again, it's like, you know, as he did in, you know, in the latter part of Seven Eves, it looks like he is kind of sneaking epic fantasy tropes into this, you know, um, high-tech SF near future novels. So it, uh, this just sounds like it's gonna be an absolute blast. Fall or Dodge in Hell, available now. And like I said, it is a high, high, high priority in the review queue. Next up, we have this uh, very shiny and very, as you see, very pretty YA novel. YA books are really going for like these gold foil stamped covers in a big way, I've noticed for a long time. Uh, but this is a new book called The Tiger at Midnight. The author is Aswati Tirdala. This looks to be one in that kind of ember in the ashes vein. Uh, let me give it a read because there was no sell sheet with this one. Uh, all right, goes like this. Isha is a legend, but no one knows. It's only in the shadows that she moonlights as the Viper, the rebel's highly skilled assassin. She's devoted her life to avenging what she lost in the royal coup. And now she's been tasked with her most important mission to date, taking down the ruthless General Hofa. Kunal has been a soldier since childhood, training morning and night to uphold the power of King Vardan. His uncle, the general, has ensured that Kunal never strays from the path, even as part of Kunal longs to join the outside world, which has been growing only more volatile. Then Isha and Kunal's paths cross, and an unimaginable chain of events unfolds. Both the Viper and the soldier think they're calling the shots, but they're not the only players moving the pieces. As the bonds that hold their land in order break down and the sins of the past meet the promise of a new future, both rebel and soldier must make unforgivable choices, drawing inspiration from ancient Indian history and Hindu mythology, and probably not a little bit from Sabah to here. Uh, the first book in Swati Tirala's debut fantasy trilogy captivates with electric romance, stunning action, and the fierce bonds that hold people together and drive them apart. Yeah, so there you are. It's, uh, you know, that kind of YA fantasy. And it is available now. I think uh, uh, Catherine Teagan Books is the publisher. And next up from Del Rey, I got this a very lovely edition. This is the third and final book in the Waking Land series by Callie Bates. It's called The Soul of Power. It too came out uh, last Tuesday uh, in hardcover. And uh, gosh, it's I really don't know what I you know want to say about these. Uh, that wouldn't be spoilery, but. Um, Anyway, it is a trilogy. Uh, the first two books were uh, the, Mem the Waking Land and the Memory of Fire, and they they have been uh, you know pegged towards like the Naomi Novik readership, uh, as it were. Uh, Catherine Arden, you know, if you're a fan of those kinds of fantasy books, this appears to be for you. But The Soul of Power uh, completes the trilogy, and it is now available in hardback from Delray Books. Uh, next up, I was sent uh, this YA book from Random House. This is one now that I was not expecting and had no expectations of, and it was completely new to me. Uh, but this is a book called Eve of Man, and the authors are Giovanna and Tom Fletcher, who are apparently like big social media YouTube hotshots. Um, they've got like millions of followers on Twitter and Instagram and YouTube. Never heard of them. That tells you exactly how connected I am to the, you know, uh, uh, social media influencer culture, basically. So I don't know who these people are, but the, apparently they have a, uh, a new YA near future novel, and it goes like this. Teens who love dystopias and science fiction with a touch of romance. There you go. 
uh, will get swept away by the first book in this brand new trilogy. Bellbinding, page turner, perfect for fans of Black Mirror and Orphan Black. And it goes like this. Uh, she survived against all odds. The first girl born in 50 years. They called her Eve. I guess because they had no imagination whatsoever. On the first day, no one really noticed. All those babies wrapped in blue blankets, not a pink one in sight. On the third day, people were scared. A statistic defying abundance of blue. Not just entire hospitals, not only entire countries, but the entire world. Boys. Only boys. Until Eve, the savior of mankind, kept protected, towering above a, a ruined world under a glass dome of safety until she is ready to renew the human race. God. That sounds like an absolutely horrible thing to, like, put on one girl. Jesus. Uh, but when the time comes to find a suitor, even Bram, a young man whose job is to prepare Eve for this moment, how? Uh, begin to question the plan they've known all along. Eve doesn't only want safety, she doesn't only want protection, she wants the truth. She wants freedom, and I understand. With romance, suspense, and a timely take on contemporary issues of women's rights, Eve of Man is unputdownable adventure. Hmm, okay. I can see how this would tie into, uh, yeah, a lot of current themes about, uh, you know, women's bodily autonomy and uh, rights and all of that sort of thing. Uh, the premise, I guess, it, it sounds like it's, it's sticking to, like, these strict notions of gender binary. I mean, the whole concept seems like it just erases, um, you know, the, the, the existence of, you know, people who are non-binary. Unless, of course, they're distinguishing biological sex from gender identity, because those are two separate things. But uh, handled well, this could be kind of interesting. So we will see. But it comes out on June the 18th from Random House, Eve of Man. Let me know in the comments. And this next one came in from Tor, and it's called Starship Repo. And it's by Patrick S. Tomlinson, and it is another in this current wave of, you know, fun space opera romps, basically. It is not a sequel, apparently. It is a standalone novel set in the same universe as Gate Crashers, which was the previous book he did in this universe. Uh, and it says, perfect for fans of John Scalzi and Becky Chambers. So there you go. This one came out way back on May 21st. All right, so it's out now. Uh, goes like this. First name, last name is a no one with nowhere to go. With a name that is the result of an unfortunate clerical error, she's destined to, want to, be, to be one of the only humans on an alien space station until she sneaks aboard a ship and joins up with a crew of repo men. They are definitely not pirates. Uh, now she's traveling the galaxy recovering quote-unquote ships. What could go wrong? So it's like that, right? And the, the tagline on the cover here says they aim to misbehave, which tells you exactly the sort of fan base they're aiming for. But yeah, it could be lots of fun. But Starship Repo is out now by Patrick Tomlinson from Tor Books. And the next book I have for you here comes in from Parvis Press. Now, this is a small press that I've gotten a few things from before. Uh, they put together really nice looking editions. They wrap up their review copies in these, you know, with this lovely twine. This is like this kind of leather, you know, cord. So it's pretty elaborate. It's like the kind of thing that I don't really want to open or have to cut it, but I might have to to get the book out. So it's a, it's a quandary. You know, it's the kind of thing that you just sometimes encounter as a reviewer. You know, what can you do? Uh, but this is The Ragged Blade. The author is Christopher Ruse. Uh, this came out last Tuesday on the 4th. And it goes like this. As a young mercenary, Richard followed a mysterious magician on a quest to steal a demon's treasure and overthrow a king. The two men started their journey as strangers, became lovers along the way, and ended as master and loyal soldier. Twenty years later, that kingdom is steadily falling into ruin, and Richard has realized that time and power have twisted the magician into more monster than man. Children disappear nightly into his dungeons, and the only things that leave are terrible creatures crafted in the shadows. To save his own daughter, Richard flees into the wastes where magic boils beneath the sand and monsters walk the dunes in the shape of men. He will return to the burning heart of the desert and restore the demon's treasure or die in the trying. What Richard doesn't know is that Anna, I guess that's his daughter, is the key to the magician's plans, and he and his favorite monster will lay waste to the world to get her back. So there you are. It's a big, you know, high fantasy uh, quest theme, a little bit of an LGBT angle thrown in there. Uh, but The Ragged Blade is available now in paperback from Parvis Press. Let me know in the comments. And the last thing I had last week for the mailbag was a massive box from Random Penguin with like five 
books in there, like three hardcovers and two trade paperbacks from like Ace, Rock, and Doll, those imprints. And it's, well, not even Rock anymore. They don't have Rock. Rock is gone. Rock has been sort of folded into Ace. So just Ace and Daw. There it is. Uh, but this is a book from Ace. It is called The Affair of the Mysterious Letter. The author is Alexis Hall. And this sounds like it's uh, one of the more entertaining spins on Sherlock Holmes that I've heard of in a while. Listen to this. Uh, Upon returning to the city of Kelethra Venn, after five years fighting a war in another universe, Captain John Wyndham, which is another nice author reference there, finds himself looking for somewhere to live, and expediency forces him to take lodgings at 221B Martyr's Walk. His new housemate is Ms. Shaharazad Haas, a consulting sorceress of mercurial temperament and dark reputation. When Ms. Haas is enlisted to solve a case of blackmail against one of her former lovers, Miss Irene Viola, or Viola, I, Viola, Miss Irene Viola, sounds right. Okay. Captain Wyndham is drawn into a mystery that leads him from the salons of the literary set to the drowned back alleys of Venn and even to a prison cell in Lost Carcosa. Uh, along the way, he is beset by criminals, menaced by pirates, molested by vampires, almost devoured by mad gods, and called upon to punch a shark. But the further the companions go in pursuit of the elusive blackmailer, the more impossible the case appears. Then again, in Kaleth Ven, reality is flexible, and the impossible is Ms. Haas's stock in trade. That just sounds like it's a hoot, and it's got all these great little sort of fantasy literary references sprinkled in there, which I dig. And it is called The Affair of the Mysterious Letter, which I think is just sort of a delightfully plain title for what could be a very exciting story. And I guess it's either available now or, you know, soonish from Ace Books. And next in that box was The Girl in Red. This is by Christina Henry. And this is the latest in a string of books that she is doing that are you know, retellings of um, fairy tale concepts basically. So this one, as you might guess, is uh, Red Riding Hood inspired. Uh, goes like this. Uh, it's not safe for anyone alone in the woods. There are predators that come out at night, critters and coyotes, snakes and wolves. But the woman in the red jacket has no choice. Not since the crisis came, decimated the population, and sent those who survived fleeing into quarantine camps that serve as breeding grounds for death, destruction, and disease. She's just a woman trying not to get killed in a world that doesn't look anything like the one she grew up in, the one that was perfectly sane and normal and boring until three months ago. There are worse threats in the woods than things that stalk their prey at night. Sometimes there are men, men with dark desires, weak wills, and evil intents. Men in uniform with classified information, secrets, and unforgiving orders. And sometimes, just sometimes, there's something worse than all the horrible people and vicious beasts combined. Red doesn't like to think of herself as a killer, but she isn't about to let herself get eaten up just because she's a woman alone in the woods. So there you have it. Do not, do not mess around with the girl in red, all right? Uh, and this is by Christina Henry, and it is new from uh, Berkeley. And next in that box, we have Pass of Fire by Taylor Anderson, and this is the 14th volume in his Destroyer Man series, which I haven't really heard very many people talk about. I have to admit, I think I have probably all of them. I haven't dug into them yet. I don't really hear a whole lot of folks buzzing about them. And yet, they must be doing well enough to, for Ace Books to justify putting out 14 volumes of them in hardcover, keeping them coming out. So they must have a core fan base. And if you are a fan, well, then you will be happy to know that Pass of Fire, which is <laughs> volume 14, as I said, uh, is a June hardcover from Ace Books. Uh, the, the concept here is, and I think it's sort of like a secondary Earth kind of uh, thing where you have... Um, the guy's on this ship, and they are, you know, allied with one group of aliens to fight another group of aliens. That sort of a thing. And I guess, uh, you know, it's been going on for a while now. All right. Pass of Fire, available in hardcover from Ace Books. And next up in that box is War, a new book by Michelle West. This is the eighth and final volume of her House War epic fantasy series. Uh, I've, I've read bits of the first one and liked what I read, so I think I do now want to get to into this series. But uh, this is the final book, as I said, book eight. It was originally planned to be seven books, but the uh, final book turned out to be so massive that she split it in two. And so that uh, came out a few months ago. It was called Firstborn, and now you have war. So as you might guess from the title, there's probably war involved. Um, but uh, Michelle West 
final volume in the House War uh, series. I almost said trilogy. <laughs> that just shows you how my brain is at this time of night. And it's available from Daw Books in June in hardcover. And finally, in the Random Penguin box, we have the new book by Sherwood Smith. This is A Sword Named Truth. It's been delayed a little bit. I think it was originally supposed to come out last August, but it is now finally here for the summer. Uh, this is the first book in a new series called Rise of the Alliance, and this is set in the same universe as her Inda novels, which have been pretty popular here on BookTube, as, uh, as I've seen. Uh, anyway, I, so I guess I can, I can read uh, something of this because it won't be spoilery. Uh, here we go. Long dormant magical forces are moving once again in Sartorius Delis, Agents of North Sunder. A mysterious bastion of incredible dark power have reappeared in the world, amassing resources and sowing instability. But with numerous nations led by young rulers brought too early to their thrones, the world is hardly ready to defend itself. Aten, still uncomfortable with her new queenship, gained after her country was freed from a Norsundrian enchantment that left it frozen outside of time for a century. Senrid strives to establish rule of law after deposing the brutal regent seeking to exert control over rebellious Jarls and a distrustful military academy. Uh, Gilo, or Hilo, J-I-L-O, I'm going to go with Hilo. Hilo never expected the responsibility of leading his nation, but when its dictator vanishes after a Norsundrian attack, Hilo finds himself stepping into the power void, taking the reins of a country so riddled with dark magic that its citizenry labors for mere survival. Claire and CJ lead a band of misfits against magical threats that overshadow their tiny country, including a direct incursion from the Norse Sundrians. And then it goes on in that vein, and so you get the idea. This uh, sounds like it's going to be really, really action-packed. Multiple characters with multiple character points of view. So if you like that kind of epic fantasy, that's what this is. A Sword Named Truth is a June hardcover from Doll Books. Okay, you guys, and there we have it. That is what you would have seen last Monday on the 3rd in the mailbag. And now we're going to go ahead with this week's stuff, but very quickly we're going to take a little brief intermission so everyone can take a little potty break. See you in a few. <laughs> Okay, everybody settled in, everybody go potty, everybody get yourself a drink, get yourself a snack, ready for the second half? Of course you are. We're going to start out with this very, very shiny pink envelope uh, from HarperCollins. Wow, very shiny pink envelope that I practically needed an acetylene torch to open. Uh, but I got it open, and this is, okay, this is something that looks like it's kind of cute. This is an arc for a book coming out on September the 17th. It's called Chilling Effect. The author is Valerie Valdez. And um, yeah, this is, again, another more lighthearted space opera, basically. Um, very much, you know, I guess all the Becky Chambers fans are putting their books out now. Uh, Chilling Effect is a madcap own voices intergalactic thrill ride that riffs on space adventure pop culture, from video games to comic books to summer blockbusters. The narrative features irresistible foul-mouthed Captain Eva Innocente and the motley crew of La Serena Negra, navigating the cultural currents of various species as they travel between star systems. Okay. Expect exciting twists and daring missions full of adventure humor and a liberal dose of Spanish profanity. All right, so get ready for that. Um, see a cover here, and there's... Uh, one thing that kind of has me a little bothered here, though, is, like, you've got these two cute kitty cats, right? And they have their little bubbly space helmets on. But, like, that's all this cat's wearing. And, like, the rest of his body is exposed to vacuum. I think that would be bad, okay? You need to get a proper spacesuit for your cat. Please. All right. Just, you know, think of the kitties. Anyway, uh, unwanted advances from total creeps are universal experience, and chilling effect quite literally. Valdez began exploring this concept as a short story about a starship captain deflecting the amorous advances of a slimeball galactic emperor, and expanded it into a novel with encouragement from friends. Okay. Uh, Captain Eva Innocente wants nothing more than to eat a few pastelitos, ditch the psychic cats in her cargo hold, and outrun the alien emperor who keeps trying to kill her for rejecting him. What she doesn't want is to become an indentured servant to a shadowy syndicate called The Fridge. Okay. 
<laughs> it's kind of on the nose, to save her kidnapped sister, who has been placed in cryostasis until her ransom is paid. To work off the debt, Eva must undergo a series of increasingly unpleasant, dangerous missions. She's willing to risk everything to free her sister, her crew, her ship, and the life she's built from the ashes of past misdeeds, but quickly she finds that the threat is even greater than she imagined. Well, this does sound like it could be a, a whole ton of fun, but uh, I just, I just want to make sure that the cats are safe, okay, please? I mean, I know they're, I guess they're alien psychic cats, but still, get them in proper spacesuits. But Chilling Effect comes out <laughs> September the 17th. Let me know in the comments. And next up, I have something here from a random penguin. Now, this looks like it could be interesting. Uh, Life and Limb uh, is a new book by Jennifer Roberson. Now, there's an author I haven't heard from in some time. And this comes out from Daw Books uh, on November the 5th. Interesting. Uh, Jennifer Oberson did um, the, she did a whole bunch of series back like in the late 90s and 2000s. And uh, now she's back with a new one that's called Blood and Bone. <coughs> Uh-oh. Don't worry, Tomi Adeyemi might uh, get upset with you for that. She got upset with Nora Roberts. But uh, anyway, well, let's see what this one's all about. His voice was rich, a much-loved baritone, as he handed his seven-year-old grandson a gun. Mm. It's time we had to talk, you and I. You won't remember it, but you need to know it, and one day when it's time, I'll call it up in you. You'll know who you are and what you're intended to do. You'll be a soldier, boy, sealed to it, life and limb, blood and bone. Not a soldier like others are, for it's not the kind of war most people fight on Earth. But because we're not most people, you and I, it will be far more important. The fate of the world will hinge upon it. Now no longer that wide-eyed child, Gabe is fresh out of prison, a leather-clad biker answering Granddaddy's peremptory summons to, of all places, a cowboy bar in northern Arizona. He's about to find out just how different he is from most people, and to meet the stranger with whom he will be sealed, life and limb, blood and bone, conscripted to fight an unholy war unlike any other. A war between allies and enemies unseen and unknown to anyone on Earth, a brutal battle between the forces of good and evil. For the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist when he does. And Gabe, thrown into the unlikely company of a country music-loving rodeo cowboy from West Texas, an ancient Celtic goddess of war, an African Orisha who sings Volcanoes Awake, a Chinese deity, Nephilim, and Grigory, finds himself finding a battle he was bred for, but wants no part of. Hmm, all right. Life and Limb. November the 5th from Doll Books by Jennifer Roberson. And kind of short for something that sounds so epic, about 260 pages. Oh, and now it looks like we have another little care package from Tor.com Publishing. Always happy to see these. And first of these is The Ascent to Godhood. This is the next novella, the fourth in J.Y. Yang's Tensorate series. This comes out July the 30th. And uh, again, don't want to read any spoilers here for those of you who haven't read these, but if you're a fan, yes, July the 30th is the day for The Ascent to Godhood, book four. And next up, a new novella that is out now. Uh, this is by an author named Vilar Kaftan, and it's called Her Silhouette Drawn in Water, and I've heard some really, really good things about this already. It goes like this. All B has ever known is darkness. She doesn't remember the crime she committed that landed her in the cold, twisting caverns of the prison planet, a Kolel Cab, with only fellow prisoner Chella for company. Chella says that they're telepaths and mass murderers, uh, that they belong here, too dangerous ever to be free. B has no reason to doubt her until she hears the voice of another telepath, one who has answers and can open her eyes to an entirely different truth. So that is Her Silhouette Drawn in Water by Viler Kaftan. And finally, we have a book that I have been looking forward to for quite a while because I've read a few stories here and there by Michael Bloomlein. And everything I've read of his, the few things I've read, have all been amazing, and I would you know, love to have seen more. And just, or, you know, I mean, it's up to me. Really. I could have made the effort to dig out more. But everything I've read by him has been great, and so I'm expecting really good things from this book called Longer, which uh, looks to be like it's a full-on short novel. It's about 220-some-odd pages. Uh, and it goes like this. In Longer, Michael Bloomlein explores epic topics. Love, the expanse of the human lifespan, mortality, with a beautifully sharp story that glows with grace and good humor even as it forces us to confront deep universal fears. Gonjita and Cav are in orbit doing research for Gleern... Yes, I think... No, Gleam. <laughs> 
Lighting. Ah, my eyes. Gleam Galactic. They are wealthy enough to participate in rejuvenation, the practice of rebooting their bodies from old age back to their 20s. Each person only gets two chances. After Gunjita has juved for the second and final time and Kaf has not, questions of ethics, life, and death test their relationship. Up among the stars, first contact is possible, but their marriage may not survive the challenge. So there you are. Very, uh, uh, an examination of, I guess, how interpersonal dynamics would be affected by things like being able to rejuvenate your body. Uh, but Longer is a novel from Michael Bloomlean, and it's available now from Tor.com Publishing. And next up, White Envelope from Macmillan. Ah, hooray! Always happy to see some finished copies showing up on my doorstep, and this is the finished copy of Lent, Joe Walton's new book, which came out on May the 28th. And uh, this is a fantasy based on an actual uh, historical individual, apparently. Uh, let's see, it tells the story of young Girolamo, I'm going to say, uh, whose life is a series of miracles. It is a miracle that he can see demons plain as day and that he can cast them out with the force of his will. But that's only the beginning because Girolamo Savonarola, who, as I mentioned, was a real guy, is not who or what he thinks he is. He will discover the truth about himself at the most startling possible time. And this will be the only beginning, only the beginning of his many lives. So yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by the look of this. Uh, but Lent by Joe Walton is available now in hardcover from Tor Books. And another Macmillan package. And this is The Hive by Orson Scott Card in collaboration with Aaron Johnston. And it is book two of the second Formic War trilogy, which follows the first Formic War trilogy. And these are apparently all a bunch of prequel novels uh, to the Ender's Game series, generally, that he's been working on with Aaron Johnston. And this one comes out tomorrow in hardcover, so if you're a fan of these, I haven't really been following the most recent uh, Ender stuff, to be honest with you, so I don't really know about the quality, but I'd kind of, I'd be interested just uh, to satisfy my curiosity to see what some of the newer books are like, right? Because I've been thinking about redoing completely from scratch my old uh, Ender's Game series overview video, which goes back almost five years. It was one of the very first videos I did. Uh, looking back on it, it's not really very good. I was still new to this booktubing game, and so it's very clunky. And I think that it's the sort of thing I could do better if I were to do it again now. But I would want to be a little bit more up to date on some of my reading in this series if I were to do it. So uh, The Hive is available tomorrow, like I said, in hardcover from Tor Books. Okay, I've got about, I think, three more packages to go. And this one right here I'm very excited about because this comes in from Word Horde. And uh, you'll see in a few minutes why I'm so excited about this. So Word Horde is an independent imprint that uh, focuses mostly on horror fiction. You kind of have to go to the indies for horror these days, although I am very excited that Tor is about to launch its, its new horror line next year sometime. Uh, but uh, Word Horde has published I think, some of my favorite horror along, you know, like in the last couple of years. You know, books like The Fisherman, by John Langan, which was brilliant, and some other really interesting books like uh, Beneath by Christy Demeester and things like that. So this one, uh, there are two books in, in this uh, package from them, and this first one is a book that is a, uh, available on the 18th. It's called A Spectral Hue. The author is Craig Lawrence Gidney. For generations, the marsh-surrounded town of Shimmer, Maryland has played host to a loose movement of African-American artists all working in different media but all utilizing the same haunting color. Landscape paintings, Trump loyal quilts, decorated dolls, mixed media assemblages, and more, all featuring the same peculiar hue, a shifting pigment somewhere between purple and pink, the color of the salt marsh orchid, a rare and indigenous flower. Graduate student Xavier Wentworth has been drawn to Shimmer, hoping to study the work of artists like quilter Hazel Whitby and landscape painter Shadrach Grayson in detail, having experienced something akin to an epiphany when viewing a Hazel Whitby tapestry as a child. Xavier will find that others too have been drawn to Shimmer, called by something more than art, something in the marsh itself, a mysterious spectral hue. And uh, yeah, and let's see, the author has uh, won a Lambda Literary Award, okay. A novel of art, obsession, and the ghosts that haunt us all. So fascinating. So uh, yeah, a spectral hue available next week from Word Horde Press. I am planning to add this to my 12 Days of Halloween uh, roster for this year. And this next one is an arc for uh, a book coming out in August, August the 27th. They don't have cover art for it yet, as you see. 
uh, but it's called A Sick Gray Laugh. And the author is Nicole Cushing. She's won the Bram Stoker Award. Award-winning author Noel Cashman. Possibly an author insert, but that's fine. Stephen King has done it many times. Uh, she is no stranger to depression and anxiety. In fact, her entire authorial brand, showcased in such titles as The Girl with the Gun in Her Mouth, Leather Noose, and The Breath Curse, has been built on the hopeless phantasmagoric visions she experiences when in the grip of paranoid psychosis. But Noelle has had enough, and author Brand Be Damned has found help for her illness in the form of an oblong yellow pill taken twice daily. Since starting on this medication, Noelle's symptoms have gone into remission. She's taken up jogging. She's joined a softball team. For the first time in Noelle's life, she feels hope. She's even started work on a nonfiction book, a history of her small southern Indiana town. But then, Noelle starts to notice the overwhelming grayness that dominates her neighborhood, slathered over everything like a thick coat of snot, th threatening to assimilate all. From Bram Stoker award-winning author Noel Cushing comes a sick gray laugh, a novel, a novel about madness, depression, history, utopian cults, literature, sports, and all the ways we struggle to stay sane in an insane world. Wow. Yeah, that, uh, this one sounds like it could be intense. So look for it. Again, my 12 Days of Halloween roster coming up. But this is available August the 27th from Word Horde Press. Okay, getting close to the bottom, and this one is in from oh, Simon Schuster. Feels like a couple of items. And I am ecstatic to get these. Uh, these are in from Saga Press, a couple of new arcs. And the first one is The Deep by River Solomon. This is her um, novel adaptation of, the, uh, of a hip-hop song, Afro, an Afrofuturist hip-hop song that was uh, a bit of a hit a couple of years ago. I think even got a Hugo nomination, as I think in related work or something like that, or our uh, performance short form, uh, one of those categories. It's about the descendants of slaves who were pitched overboard in the slave ships and, uh, you know, who formed an aquatic civilization, basically. Yitu holds the memories for her people. Her people, water-dwelling descendants of pregnant African slave women thrown overboard by slavers. They live idyllic lives in the deep. Their past too traumatic to be remembered regularly is forgotten by everyone, save one. Save the historian. Ye too remembers for everyone, and the memories, painful and wonderful, traumatic and terrible and miraculous, are destroying her. And so she flees to the surface, escaping the memories and the expectations and the responsibilities, and discovers a world her people left behind long ago. Ye too will learn more than she ever expected to about her own past and about the future of her people. If they're all to survive, they'll need to reclaim the memories, reclaim their identities, and own who they really are. Um, inspired by the hit song by Clipping, comprised of David Diggs, William Hudson, and Jonathan Snipes, the deep will resonate long after the last page is turned. And this will be available on November the 5th from Saga Press. Very short, 155 pages. And next in that package is the arc for A Choir of Lies, which is by Alexandra Rowland. It is the sequel to A Conspiracy of Truths, which came out last November, which I haven't quite gotten to yet, but everyone who has read it says that it is absolutely freaking amazing, so I am ready for it. But A Choir of Lies is the sequel to that book, and it is available in September. And I don't really know what I can say about the original book. Uh, that wouldn't be spoilery, and... It has to do with uh, the power of storytelling and the power of narrative and how narratives can shape or make or break histories, basically. So it sounds like a really fascinating premise. And this is the sequel, as I said, in September from Saga Press. And last one, everybody. This one is in from Harper Collins. Okay, this is one that I am really, really happy to have. Uh, in fact, Christopher Brown uh, just uh, messaged me not long ago on Twitter and said, have you got the arc for this yet? Because I'll make sure you get it. And I'm like, I hadn't got it yet. He's like, oh, don't worry, I'll get on that. And so here it is. So thank you for that, Christopher. Uh, but this is Rule of Capture by Christopher Brown. And uh, this is uh, a book that is not a sequel to, but it is set in the same dystopian future as Tropic of Kansas, which I reviewed last year, and which has got to be the bleakest and most disturbing dystopia I've read recently, because, if only because there is so little of a leap in imagination that you have to make between like current events and how things are trending and what goes on in that book, 
that it really is like the more I think about it, the more like frighteningly prescient it becomes. So we can only hope. But Rule of Capture, as I said, is the new one. This comes out August the 13th and it sounds a little bit more like th this one might have a bit more of a satirical spin uh, than Tropic of Kansas, which was as <laughs> serious as a heart attack. This one sounds like it might not be quite that heavy duty, but um, goes like this. Defeated in a devastating war with China and ravaged by cl climate change, America is on the brink of a bloody internal strife. Seizing power after a controversial election, the ruling regime has begun cracking down on dissidents, fighting the nation's slide toward dictatorship. For Donny Kimo, chaos is good for business. His newest client, young filmmaker Zelina uh, Rocafuerte, witnessed the murder of an opposition leader and is now accused of terrorism. To save her from the only sentence worse than death, Donnie has to extract justice from a system that has abandoned the rule of law. That means breaking the rules and risking the same fate as his clients. Donnie isn't just fighting for his client's life, he's battling for his own. But as the trial in the top secret court begins, Zelina's friends set into motion a revolutionary response that could destroy the case. And when another case unexpectedly collides with Zelina's, Donnie uncovers even more devastating secrets, knowledge that will force him to choose between saving one client or the future of the entire country. So this has been described as Better Call Saul meets 1984. And it is available August the 13th from Harper Voyager. And there you have it. That's what we got. Two weeks worth of the mailbag here. You guys know the drill. Light up those comments. Let me know which of these looks the most interesting and exciting to you and which you would like to see me prioritize for review. Otherwise, if you enjoyed watching, please hit that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and above all, please sub if you have not done so. That is how the channel grows. I think it would be really, really cool to maybe see if I could tip 7,000 by the time the middle of August rolls along, a couple of months from now, when it's time for Worldcon, that would be awesome. Maybe. We'll see, right? But otherwise, thank you so much. You can also support the channel at my Tee Public store and at my Patreon, where recruits into Wink's Army get little perks, like getting to see some of these videos early, if I'm able to get them up early for you. I want to thank all of those people for their additional support. It is very, very much appreciated. I use my Patreon money basically to pay for my thumbnails, my lovely thumbnails that Matt Olson has faithfully done for me for more than five years. So that has been a wonderful working relationship. And I want to thank the rest of you guys for being the very best viewers in all of BookTube. And until I see all of you next time, happy reading.